All right, guys, this is our first answer to a question asked by James Monroe. And it's pretty interesting. I don't think you're going to be uh, getting it in any of your classes, but he wanted me to explain certain questions regarding the Red Bull air jump. So um, they said he reached uh, supersonic. Um, speeds, you know, supersonic speeds, and he broke the sound barrier. Sound barrier. All right, a couple minutes with this. He never reached supersonic speeds, as far as I know. Supersonic speeds are between Mach uh, one point two to 5.0, which is anywhere up to 1710 meters per second. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty fast. He reached something called transonic speed. Transonic speeds, which is between Mach 8 and Mach 1.2, which is exponentially much lower. It's about 410 meters per second. So it's definitely a lot faster. So a couple other questions um, they're asking. So you have this guy, he's in a giant balloon, and he's crashing down to Earth, right? So why doesn't he burn up? Why does he reach speeds past terminal velocity? Well, down here on Earth, air is thick. There's more air down here, and less air up here. Less air. Since there's less air resistance, air resistance, which is determined by your different drag coefficients and your drag forces when you when a man's falling, you know you got force of gravity and you got your force of your drag. And that's what essentially will determine your terminal velocity based on density of air. Since air is a lot less dense, up at 23 miles up or however high he was, he's going to be able to reach supersonic speeds. And actually, there's something called, they ask, like, why is it the way it is? Well, the main thing, let's say this is the top view. Top view. And you're viewing him falling down. If you want to take his general cross-sectional area of however much of the body, the cross-sectional distribution along body is independent of shape. Independent of shape. So really, his body, the way he's falling, really doesn't matter. It's just his body alone. Of course, you can increase air resistance once you get down lower, but it's different. Second question is, what's the highest speed you can possibly meet? There's something called high hypersonic, which is up to Mach 25, and then there's something called re-entry points, which is anywhere greater than Mach 25, which is really, really high. So how do we determine what's going on, or how do we determine the Mach speeds that we're dealing with? And I'm just going to define some terms for you so you understand how I'm going to derive this because I'm going to write it pretty small. Let's say we have PT, which is our total pressure, right? Then we'll have QC, which is our impact pressure. We'll call M our free stream Mach number. And this is in response to him asking um, what preparations and calculations would they have done to make sure that he'd be safe or the physics behind this all. And then we'll call this gamma. That's not a Y. And gamma is going to be ratio of specific heat at a constant pressure. 
for now because we know pressure as it falls is not going to be constant, so we're going to be taking the limit. We'll call P as opposed to PT our static pressure. So the isotropic flow of the ratio of the total pressures to the static pressures, if we take PT over P, you're going to get 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 and squared is a pre-derived equation and we take that exponentially from y minus, gamma minus 1 and so as you can see as you increase the values of uh, your, your pressure as we take let's say the limit as um, sorry, if we take the limit, or you could say the derivative, but if we take the limit of gamma, gamma approaches some infinite value, or some greater than one value, you're just going to end up with your constant exponential that you're going to see that it's just going to keep increasing. And why is that? If we take it as a function of pt over p, and we take the limit of that. We see that because uh, gamma, sorry, gamma over gamma minus one. No matter what value we're plugging in for y, gamma, I'm sorry, the value is just going to keep increasing. So it's going to be an exponential growth. So as you can see, your total pressure is always going to be increasing as your ratio is also increased, which tends to say, which doesn't really make a difference for constant pressure at this point. Now, let's take dynamic pressure. Because you're not going to always be dealing with uh, static pressure in this case. And we'll call our dynamic pressure any value for, let's just say, Q. Dynamic pressure is going to be gamma over our rho value which is our mass density. And we take that over the free stream Mach number squared. Now, if we take Bernoulli's equation, equation for values of Mach less than one, which is the speed he was reaching initially, right before he broke the sound barrier, we simply rearrange the uh, the formula that we get, and if you actually expand it out into its full form, you're going to get M2. And I'm going to show you where this is actually derived from versus your impact pressure over your static pressure plus one. Sorry, that looks. And again, where we move this down, gamma minus one over gamma. We take that minus one, and this is for again subsonic, subsonic values. If you were going to calculate supersonic values, you use something called Relay's equations. And of course, because I'm in square, we take the square root of the whole value. Sorry, I'm not doing it in a different color. Now, we also have to consider our drag coefficient. Because the drag coefficient is the function of the Mach number when dealing with an incompressible flow. So if we take that, so let me write that down. The drag coefficient is a function of the Mach number when dealing with compressible flow. It's kind of irrelevant, but we could just say for its case that it'd be the same. This is the force of the drag coefficient. You get one half rho. Mass density 
this case would be for air d squared, and this is speed relative to the fluid. And then, of course, you get CD, which is your coefficient. And then this we'll put in A in there as your reference area. So finally, we want to solve for CD. And once we do that, we get the force of our drag coefficient times 2 divided by rho, or rho value. And then divide by c squared a. That equals our cd value. This is our drag coefficient, right? So once our drag coefficient, let me explain there. <sighs> okay, so. Once we calculate that, we know that our drag coefficient is constantly increasing. So once you take the limit, or in this case, the function, we'll call this f of f d. Yeah, we'll call it f of f d. Where c d approaches an infinite value, there's nothing limiting it in this case. Um, and as a function of fd, it's just also going to be increasing. So as it increases, it's going to max out by what value? Well, what's the only value that stays constant at a certain point here? It's the mass density of your area, but your area is not going to determine how you're falling. The mass density of air is actually going to determine it. So if we look at our mass density, once we reach a a critical value. That's when we reach terminal velocity. Now to answer the other part of the question, why doesn't he burn up when he does this? Like I said before, because Because he's actually in an area where air is less dense, you're not going to get that much friction, which generates heat. That's why it doesn't really matter. Uh, and that's about it to explain the Red Bull Skydive. Or stratosphere.